Today we honor Edward Stevenson and his families. Soon after DeWitt was evacuated by the saints, Sasha Woods called the mob together, making a speech unto them that they must hasten to assist their friends in Davies County. The land sales, he said, were coming on, and if they could drive the Mormons, they could get the land. The brethren were in great danger and on suspense in Adam and Iaman. But just in time, General Donovan ordered Colonel Hinkle to raise a company of militia in our county to march to White Settlement, Diamond, and defend the Mormons from attack by those mobbers who he reported as being seven or eight hundred strong. Brother Joseph called for all who would stand by him to meet him on the public square the next morning, prepared to march to Diamond by sunrise. I shall never forget the circumstance, for the impression was indelible. Baggage wagons were provided to carry our bedding and necessary luggage, and about 100 of us on foot marched 25 miles that day, and our beds were made on the ground under trees, and some few had tents. Others slept in stable lofts on hay. Several inches of snow fell on one night. The next morning, blankets, bed quilts, etc., were shaken, and to see our poorly provided for militia exposed as we were, crawling out from under snow, made feelingly impressions not soon to be forgotten. Although it is 54 years ago at this time of writing, 1892, I fancy that I see the wintry scene with campfires after clearing away the snow cooking, eating, and after drilling the inexperienced militia, Joseph the prophet on the campgrounds was to be seen cheering up the chilly boys. And for a change, Brother A.O. Smoot was challenged for a battle, which was to be fought with snowballs. Two lines were formed of about equal strength and a charge made, and for a time the snowballs flew rapidly. Some soon gave out, while others continued. But finally, after some got well pelted and snow well filled in around their necks, all in good humor and full of mirth, the object accomplished, the monotony broken, all felt, although our cause was good, it was rather a hard way to build up Zion. My bed the following night was in Lyman White stable loft, and the only chance was with no other alternative to make my bed in a pile of corn cobs. I leave the reader to judge the rest of the story as to the comfort or convenience. For my part, I realized that it was much better than to lie out in the snow and wet cold ground. However, I was a little put out the next morning to find my straw hat out of its place between the logs of the stable, for it was built of logs. It was under my near neighbor's head. Well, of this as well as many other inconveniences, we had to make the best of it and above all, to keep in good humor. In the state of Missouri, snow does not last long, for the climate is very moderate, so that in about two days it was all over, and pretty weather again. Now follows a scene which eclipses our snow squall so badly that we awaken to sadder scenes, house burning and driving helpless aged men, women, and little children from their hard-earned homes and they fleeing from them for their lives, to behold their homes in flames after they were pillaged of the most valuable content. One case I will mention as a sample of many other similar circumstances, which is the wife of a missionary who was on a mission preaching the gospel in Tennessee, namely Agnes M. Smith, wife of Don Carlos Smith, brother of the prophet whose house having been plundered and burned by the mob, she had traveled three miles with two helpless babes, having in her flight waded Grand River. No clothing, homeless, and nearly exhausted, she arrived at Adamondiaman. House burning and plundering had become frequent, and the whole country was in confusion. About this time, General Parks arrived in Davies County. Colonel Lyman White was acting as a militia officer under General Clark, Colonel White holding a commission as colonel in the 59th Regiment, was holding the mob in check with the forces of Diamond 
and those ordered out by General Donovan under Colonel Hinkle, so that we were acting under official orders of the state of Missouri, while the house-burning mob were a mob of plunderers. Millport, only a few miles away from Diamond, were the headquarters of the mob. They became alarmed and fled from the town just as the company was on their way to that place where we arrived after dark, having passed a returning company who had captured the cannon belonging to the mob, who in their fear and flight had buried it in the road. It was discovered by a brother Stephen Hale, I believe. The mob had become frightened in their nefarious work, not only with the will of the Latter-day Saints in defense of their families and homes, and acting under state authority. But General Park, who at this time appeared to wish fair dealing with the assailed Mormons, his approaching army served just in time to dampen the ardor of this large mob. They fled to await greater strength and opportunity. The company arrived safely with the cannon at Diamond, and we at Millport, where we struck a silent camp and put out proper guards with strict orders to strike no light and make no noise, for Millport, the mob headquarters, had just been deserted, and we only a small company on foot without bedding or any camp equipage, whatever, not knowing what might befall us any moment, as we had gone out to render any aid necessary to the company already out to protect our people, who were being burned out and scattered from their homes. Our only alternative was to remain silent and pass the most dreary night, or the balance of it, as best we could. Orders were to lie down with our arms where we could at any moment seize them in case of a sudden attack by the enemy, who were liable to pounce upon us unawares. So I spent part of the night with gun in arms on the floor, without bed or covering, feet wet and shiveringly cold. This, with my corncob bed in the time of the snowstorm in Diamond, will never be forgotten by me as long as time shall roll on into eternity. Then will tears and sorrow and our trials be turned into joy that we have been counted worthy to pass through these scenes, for in our feeble way, striving to lay the foundation of Christ's church and gospel, which we most assuredly know has been established in our day and that our loved prophet Joseph, the main target aimed at, and who can tell what the future will bring forth about this time of deep, dark, trying times. Thomas B. Marsh and Orson Hyde left these parts and went to Richmond, Ray County, Missouri, where the prophet Joseph said he was informed they testified against us. Fear, no doubt, took possession of them, for without the light of the Spirit, darkness prevailed. But by aid of the Spirit, the silvery lining to the dark cloud was visible. Many turned away for a time, but like Brother Hyde, Phelps, and even Marsh, returned a mere wreck. Never was a morning more welcome than was the break of day to us, and to learn that our foes were far away at that time. We gathered food for breakfast, for not a soul could be seen. However, cattle, hogs, chickens, etc., remained in the pretty town of Millport. This morning we heard the report of the mob cannon, but fired in our own camp. Sometime in September, 9th, I believe, I was here to aid and defend the saints when Captain William Allred, acting under military orders, captured a team loaded with guns and ammunition and took them with three prisoners. They were taking them to the mob to murder us. After breakfast, we returned to Diamond. Millport was burned and not a single house left, and to this day has not been built up again. Now see the stratagem resorted to by our enemies. The Missouri mob, seeing the timely aid of government troops and the Mormon defenders of homes and families. Here's what the prophet said. The mob, seeing that they could not succeed by force, now resorted to stratagem, and after removing their property out of their houses, which were log houses, and most of them without windows, for I saw them, they fired them and then reported to the authorities of the state that the Mormons were burning and destroying all before them. On the 25th October, after the battle on Crooked River, great excitement prevailed all over the country. 
Here's a report that went from Lexington, 6 o'clock a.m., to Amos Reese and Wiley Williams. Richmond is threatened tonight. The Mormons attacked Captain Bogart this morning at daylight and had cut off his whole company of 50 men. One of Bogart's companies came in and reported that 10 of his comrades were killed and the remainder of the company were taken prisoners after many of them were severely wounded, that Richmond would be sacked and burned by Mormon bandits tonight. Nothing can exceed the consternation which this news gave rise to. The women and children were fleeing from Richmond in every direction, and 100 daring, brave men will give the Mormons at Richmond tonight a warm reception. Hurry on to Jefferson City. Also impart correct information to the public as you go along. Send a messenger to Howard, Cooper, and Boone companies in order that volunteers may be raised, flocking to the scene of trouble as soon as possible. They must haste and put a stop to the devastation which is menaced by these infuriated fanatics. They must go prepared to exterminate or expel them from the state en mass. Nothing but this will restore tranquility to the public mind and establish supremacy to the land and laws. Only think of a law which would expel 15,000 men, women, and children from the State of the Union without trial, investigation, judge, or jury. Very loyal indeed. There must be no further delaying with this question anywhere. The Mormons must leave the State, or we will one and all, and to this complexion it must come at last. We have greater reliance upon your ability, discretion, and fitness for the task you have undertaken. And we have only time to say, God speed you, yours truly, E.M. Ryland. Sir, since the order of the morning to you, information of the most appalling character, which changes the whole face of things, and places the Mormons in open and avowed defiance of the laws, and of having made open war upon the people of this state, your orders are therefore to hasten your operations and endeavor to reach Richmond in Ray County with all possible speed. The Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state, if necessary, for the public good. Their outrages are beyond all description. I am a witness that I was, and without cause, driven by mob violence from my farm in Davies County, leaving my crops and all without remuneration, and now exterminated or driven from the state. L.W. Boggs, Governor and Commander-in-Chief to General Clark. Great excitement now prevailed, and mobs were heard of in every direction, who seemed determined on our destruction. They burned the houses in the country and took off all the cattle they could find. They destroyed cornfields, took many prisoners, and threatened death to all the Mormons. October 30th, the advance guard were patrolling the country, taking prisoners. Brother William Carey, with his skull made bare, being struck with a rifle, was thrown into a wagon as a prisoner. I saw him when brought in to Far West, and to see the inhuman sight and the meeting of his family was a distressing sight. George M. Hinkle took a company out to Long Creek, where we camped, put out our guards, and sent Reed Peck with a flag of truce to meet the mob. While thus we were waiting, a dispatch came from far west for our return as the mob was burning Nabtown. This occurred while our company was scattered in the woods gathering hickory nuts and other wild nuts, fruits, etc., which grew in this country prolifically. The order was soon sounded, for it was in haste, and soon all were engaged in saddling up our horses when we formed in line and on the march just in time to avert the troops if it were not for our timely and providential call to far west, our foes would have come upon us while we were scattered, and we could not possibly have had time to have been on the move before we should have been surrounded by our numerous enemies, which would have placed us in a very unenviable position, to say the least of it. But as it was, before we were able to successfully move far on our way, our course was intercepted by the mob for they were formed in line of battle between us and far west. We could distinctly hear their word of command informing the enemy in line, 
for we were just about emerging from the woodland to the open prairie where our foes, more than ten to one of us, had cut off our direct line of march. On hearing the word of command of our foes, it was not hard for us to comprehend our perilous condition. Our word was, of course, halt, when scouts were sent out to discover our enemy's condition, plans, and movements. Very soon after that, Colonel G. M. Hinkle came back on the line of our small company saying, there are enough of our enemies to eat us up if they were only to take a mouthful apiece. To me, he appeared very excited and frightened, and by the way, he had his military coat off as if not to be known as chief officer of our company, for I thought he was fearful of an attack and did not wish to be a picked shot with his uniform coat on. His cowardice was soon after made more fully manifest. Truly we were in a perilous condition, an army of about 3,000 well-armed men between us and our city, and they on their way or march there. After due deliberation, our conclusion was the best possible chance for us was to retreat. Our way to pass our enemies lay through fields, woods, brush, and over small streams 15 miles, while they had a good clear roadway and only 5 miles, and as far west was their point of attack, it became very necessary that we should gain the point before they should massacre our friends at home. We wheeled our line about face, and as we had three miles to travel to our foes only one, we all of us felt that our flight must be at the best rate possible, knowing that our way before us was a hard one to surmount and overcome. But we knew our cause was a good one, and in God we put our trust, and cheerfully and merrily wended our way, soon passing through the gates of Father Timothy B. Clark's farm. Our foes had captured two sons of Father Clark who were gathering turnips, taking them prisoners with the company wagon, load of turnips, team, and all together. While galloping over logs, creeks, brush, and here and there strips of prairie and woods, it was not without deep thoughts of what possibly could be the result. Naturally, without heaven's interference and divine interposition in our behalf, there was the least shadow of a hope no gleam, no, not a ray of light now perceptible. A great army of war, 3,000 approaching, while mobs were joining them, swelling their number, and scattering mob bands, plundering, burning, and killing cattle, hogs, and destroying our crops. And we only a little handful of about 15,000 men, women, children, and the feeble of both male and female all told, in the whole state of Missouri with the governor, L.W. Boggs, at the head. Then we took fresh courage as we came charging into, or rather near, to the city. Our brethren at first took us for the mob, but were pleased to learn that we were not enemies but friends in a time of need. Our enemies were forming into line of battle on the outskirts of far west where our small line was formed to repel any mob violence, although ever so much superior in numbers. There were about eight or ten of our foes to each one of the little band. When we dismounted and joined the line of our friends, we took bullets into our mouths. So as in case of close action, we could charge with power and quickly spit a wet bullet into our gun, and being wet would gather around it powder and be more efficient and quicker, for we intended to do our best. With such great odds, Joseph the prophet stood at the head of the little band while our numerous hosts were forming and making ready, and I can readily call to mind how they looked, and so nearby. Soon the prophet brightened up and said, Be of good cheer. There are more for us than against us. The hosts of heaven are watching over us. Partly stooping, he passed along behind the line, saying, Fear them not, brethren. Their hearts are as cold as a cucumber. And giving at the same time the pass or watchword, God and liberty. After some runners back and forth, night approaching, the army which had 1,000 more added to their hosts concluded that they would not begin to put their exterminating order in our murder tonight, but retired one mile on Goose Creek and camped, 
where my widowed mother had some timberland. Our guards were put out and we took refreshments. The campfires of our enemies on the banks of Goose Creek were ablaze in the darkness. Brother Carey, who was brought in with his skull wounded badly, being laid bare, having been struck with a rifle over the head and thrown into a wagon in this mangled condition, uncared for, he was brought to his family and soon after died, 31 October 1838. And now, while writing this sad story, it seems to me I fancy hearing the screams of his wife and children at the sad sight. During the night, a temporary breastwork of logs, wagons, and timbers was thrown up, which the next morning looked like a wonderful night's work, and considerably warlike. The sisters had gathered up many of their valuables and expected battle, and they would have to flee. The saints had gathered into the city, leaving their homes in the country, fleeing from the mobs which were pilfering, destroying property, and taking prisoners. It was a time of trouble indeed. The Hans Mill Massacre took place yesterday, 18 miles on Shoal Creek. Nineteen who were cruelly murdered were buried in an old well, thrown in promiscuously and covered up and left alone to molder. One of the murderers, Colonel William O. Jennings, who commanded the mob, was assassinated in Chillicothe, Livingston's County, Missouri, in the evening of January 30th, 1862, by an unknown person. The day was one of suspense and looked gloomy. As the militia, we were on duty. My station was behind the breastwork near the road running from far west to Richmond and to the enemy's camp. Occasionally, drums and martial land music could be heard, commands being given by the enemy's camp as if coming to murder us outright. Flags of truce were met by Colonel Hinkle, and the traitor which he proved to be entered into a league with our opponents to give up our leader, arms, and property. Colonel Hinkle deceived the brethren, who went to have an interview with the officers, they crossing the breastworks close by where I was stationed. Soon after they met the officers, who immediately took the brethren, Joseph, Sidney, Colonel White, and G.W. Robinson, as prisoners of war, to their camp, where they were abused shamefully, surrounded by demons in human form, and kept all night. I remember standing guard that night. Charles C. Rich passed me several times, as well as others, preparing to take their leave in the wilderness. It seemed as though 10,000 kept up a constant yelling in the mob camp. The loud yells, cursings, and blasphemous language against the Mormons was enough to appall the stoutest hearts. Our leaders in their hands, the cold ground for their beds, but the Lord prevented them from taking their lives. The 1st of November opened up with great anxiety. After a night of dreadful uproar, Hiram Smith and Amasa L. Lyman were taken to the mob camp who proclaimed themselves as state troops, who held the court-martial and sentenced the brethren to be shot the next day on our public square. General Donovan, whom I knew as a liar, declared that he would not consent to such an act of cold-blooded murder, and he would withdraw his brigade. This proved to be a ram in the thicket in this case and served as a check on their murderous design. General Lucas ordered the Caldwell militia to give up our arms by an arrangement entered into by Colonel Hinkle, who was a colonel of the county militia. Consequently, we were marched into a hollow square where we were formed into a square surrounded by an armed force in a hollow square and by orders given to ground arms. We advanced one step and grounded our guns and stepped back in the line. Then sidearms were ordered to the center and left in a pile such as pistols, swords, etc. Brother Alexander McRae drew his sword and stabbed it into the ground after passing the six cuts. I heard one of the mob crowd say, By gee, that man would fight. And another said, well, it is good as dead for the Mormons now as we have got their arms. We left our arms in possession of our foes, and then we were marched onto the public square and threatened by the officers and others that we must scatter among other people, 
never gather in bodies of the people anymore. We would have to leave the state of Missouri. We need not expect to have our leaders anymore. They would be punished. Colonel Hinkle said, I have now got my hand out of the lion's mouth and shall keep it out and would advise you to do the same. Colonel Hinkle was now an apostate and joined in with the mob. I also saw William McClellan with the mob's mark, a piece of red flannel pinned on the shoulder. Our town was pillaged by the governor's mob militia, women abused, children frightened, things overturned, and a general time of confusion and consternation. At far west, 56 of the brethren were made prisoners by order of General Clark, and for what they knew not, but were kept under guard. General Clark paraded us in far west and addressed us. Gentlemen, you whose names are not attached to this list of names will have the privilege of providing wood, corn, etc. for your families. Those who are now taken will go to prison, be tried, and receive the due demerits of their crimes. But you, except such as charges may hereafter be preferred against, are at liberty as soon as the troops are removed that now guard the place. The treaty which you have entered into, the leading items of which I will lay before you. The first requires that your leading men be given up to be tried according to law. This you have already complied with. Second is that you deliver up your arms. This has been attended to. Third, that you sign over your property to defray the expense of the war for mobbing free citizens. This you have also done. Another article yet remains for you to comply with, that is, that you leave the state forthwith, and whatever may be your feelings concerning this, or whatever your innocence, it is nothing to me. The orders of the governor to me were that you should be exterminated, and not allowed to remain in the state, and had not your leaders been given up, and the terms of the treaty been complied with, before this, you and your families would have been destroyed, and your houses in ashes. There is a discretionary power vested in my hands which I shall exercise in your favor for a season. For this favor you are indebted to my clemency. I do not say you shall go now, but you must not think of staying another season or of putting in crops. For the moment you do this, the citizens will be upon you, of course according to laws. If I am called here again in case of non-compliance of a treaty made, do not think that I shall act any more as I have done. You need not expect any mercy but extermination, for I am determined the governor's orders shall be executed. As for your leaders, do not once think, do not imagine for a moment, do not let it enter into your mind that they will be delivered or that you will see their faces again, but did all the same. For their fate is fixed, their die is cast, their doom is sealed. I am sorry, gentlemen, to see so great a number of apparently intelligent men found in the situation you are, and oh, that I could invoke that great spirit, the unknown God, without body, parts, or passion, sitting upon nothing or topless, beyond any place, to rest upon you and make you sufficiently intelligent to break that chain of superstition and liberate you from those fetters of superstition and fanaticism with which you are bound that you no longer worship a man. I would advise you to scatter abroad and never again organize yourselves with bishops, presidents, etc., lest you excite the jealousies of the people and subject yourselves to the same calamities that have now come upon you, just as if this was a crime. I am only pleased that I was counted worthy to hear and witness those words and scenes, for the fact is I own land in Davis County, and my mother owned land on Goose Creek, where the troops camped, and a house and land in the city of Far West, and we were robbed of our homes and driven away from them without either remuneration or cause. 10 November. The brethren at Far West were crowded, the weather turned cold, and the brethren in Adamondiamon had only ten days to leave the county. Many had to live in tents in Caldwell County. The estimated number of our brethren killed is about thirty, a multitude wounded, and about one hundred missing. 
and about 60 at Richmond imprisoned, waiting trial for what they know not. The affliction of the saints are truly great, and our situation very painful. Mr. Henry Coleman, postmaster at Liberty and Tinner, sent me a letter to come and finish learning my trade with him, and having all our property taken away for the want of something better, I set in the second time to learn the tinner's trade, by which in Utah I was much benefited. My time was taken up, and I made good progress. I was forty miles away from far west, but there were some of our people around, so I had some company, and the winter soon passed away. Tuesday came, and the mob came also, bearing with them a red flag in token of blood. No sacrifice would answer, only to leave the county or die. The result of poor defenseless people left the county under mob rule, but not without some being whipped, houses torn down, being harassed by day and by night. Sidney Gilbert and Company's store broken open, goods strewn in the streets. A party of about 30 were set upon by about double of the number of the mob. One of our people was killed, and two or three of the mob were killed. Fifty-one guns were given up by our people, which never have been returned, neither paid for. Women and children were driven from their homes, leaving tracks of blood. The people of Clay County received the Mormons. About two hundred buildings were either burned or destroyed. After three years' sojourn in Clay County, all removed to Caldwell County and Davies County. Here land was purchased again of the government and otherwise, and peace for a season. Driving the Mormons from DeWitt, riding two of them on a cannon, said they would drive them, the Mormons, from Davies County to Caldwell and from Caldwell to Hell, and they would give them no quarter, only at the cannon's mouth. The petition winds up by saying, We ask for the privilege granted to all free citizens of the United States and of this state to be extended to us, that we may be permitted to settle and live where we please and worship God according to the dictate of our conscience without molestation. And while we ask for ourselves this privilege, we are willing all others should enjoy the same. I am not now writing from hearsay, neither night dreaming, but from actually passing through solid experience and suffering and the governor without nerve or backbone enough only to become a silent partner, and I want my children and children's children to raise a protesting voice against such high-handed injustice, and by the help of a just God we will ask and petition governors, yes, and presidents, suing for our just rights and liberties, politically and religiously, until we shall be heard. If not by man, God shall hear our cries, until our liberty shall be given us, if not before. It shall be when Jesus comes in the seventh thousandth year, who will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. For in the name of the Lord I will not submit to be robbed and driven as a dog from my hard-earned home without solemnly protesting against such unholy, unlawful treatment. I left my boss without completing my trade, saying unto him, Although I might be permitted to remain with you and complete my trade, which I have no doubt I could do by abridging myself of my religion and keeping my tongue still, but only think my widowed mother, two younger sisters, and still a younger brother. My friends and all leave, and me remain in a state which would rob them of every liberty? No, sir. I will go with them and run the consequences of my future destiny, and so I did. Sometime in April, 1839, I found myself with mother and family in Quincy, Illinois. Most of the saints were out of the state of Missouri. I took some grubbing of land for five dollars an acre, which was very low wages and very hard labor for one in his nineteenth year of age. We found ourselves exiles without money and only one cow and a calf left. Although we had left a farm in Michigan and yet owned it, or a part of it, about 80 acres with house and home, but we had put our hand to the plow and did not feel to look back, but upward and onward, for God was able to carry on his good work already begun. 
We had all confidence that our way would be opened up for our future welfare. Not one of our little family wished to return to our former home in Michigan. And so I grabbed on and we were able to keep soul and body together. About this time, Sister Fosdick moved from far west. It was her husband who baptized me December 20th, 1833 in Michigan, Japheth Fosdick. I felt happy to grub on looking for something better. We were able to make our living by our work, although the grubbing was heavy work for us. At a general conference near Quincy, Illinois, at the Presbyterian campground, which I attended on the fourth day of May, 1839. I was 19 years and four days old. At this conference, it was resolved that this conference was entirely satisfied with and gives their sanction to the proceeding of the Conference of the Twelve and their friends held on the Temple Spot at Far West Missouri on Friday the 26th of April last. Resolved also that the action of the cutting off of the 31 from the church at the same time be sanctioned. There was a little circumstance that took place at that general conference which has ever since borne impressively on my mind, not only from the words spoken but the spirit and force and expression which the prophet Joseph Smith possessed at the time when he uttered them. I do not remember ever seeing them written. In fact, the glow of the spirit which to me radiated his countenance, could never be written. Only the words could be penned. I have often heard the prophet speak from a wagon which would elevate him above the audience, and I believe my memory serves me right on this occasion he did so. When he arose, he stood for an unusual length of time without uttering a word. His soul was filled with emotion, and it seemed as though relief could not be uttered, only with a flood of tears. He looked calm, however, and a halo of brightness hovered about him. We must remember that it was only the 22nd day of last month, 12 days ago, that the prophet escaped from the hands of his enemies, and for a season to enjoy the sweets of liberty, hence a good cause of this sensation coming over him. For the prophet was of a tender heart, as well as of a stern and firm disposition when occasion required it. I have known the prophet to weep with tender affection, and have seen him with his sword drawn as a military officer when he was mighty as well as powerful, but never more so than on the occasion when he stood upon the small frame building addressing the Nauvoo Legion, which was so powerful that scarce was there a dry eye to be seen and even one of our opponents standing near me in tears, saying, Never again will I be found speaking against that man. To know the prophet truly was to love him. After the prophet had looked over the congregated saints in the Presbyterian campground, he said, To look over this congregation of Latter-day Saints who have been driven from their homes and still in good faith, without homes as pilgrims in a strange land, and to realize that my life has been spared to behold your faces again seemed to me so great a pleasure that the present scene was so great a satisfaction that words seemed only a vague expression of my soul's gratitude. These may not be just the words expressed, but they were the sentiments impressed upon my mind, written as with an iron pen and engraven on the tablets of my heart forever. At this conference, it was resolved that the purchase of land by the church in Iowa Territory of half-breed Indian land be sustained for a gathering place of the Latter-day Saints. I still kept up my work in Quincy for a short time, while some began to prepare to move up into Iowa and Commerce, Illinois. About the middle of May 1839, I, with my mother, two sisters, and brother James moved over into Iowa Territory, and our home was in the United States barracks, which were vacated. Poor as they were, we were glad to get free shelter once more. My mother and sisters were compelled to go out to work, and I returned to Quincy, Illinois, and found work at a steam sawmill for 50 cents a day, where I worked some time. I also worked at a steam sawmill in Tula, Missouri, 
on Old Mississippi River and fired up for three-cylinder steam boiler at 50 cents a day, which was the usual wage per day. Here I got my board. It was rather hard and hot work, but all of us in our exiled condition, leaving all of our possessions behind us in Missouri State, were compelled to do the best. This was the first time that I met Father Sanford Porter, who was moving from Van Buren County, Missouri, to Iowa by team and wagon. Nancy A. Porter climbed up on a wagon wheel to see a Mormon boy doing a man's work at a steam mill. This was after Father Porter had been down to the mill and had talked with me. I was very small of my age at that time, and he told the family that there was a Mormon boy working and that he was the son of a widow doing a man's work to help to support the family who had been robbed of their home and property, which was a sore trial, but the fate of faithful Mormons. This was what created the excitement at the wagons, causing a curiosity of Nancy A. Porter to see strangely one who six years afterwards became the husband of the one who climbed up on the wagon wheel to see the Mormon boy. For the Porter family settled in Iowa in the very same neighborhood as did the Mormon boy who was working at the steam mill. After earning some money, I returned home to Montrose, Lee County, Iowa. Soon after a rest at home, I returned to Quincy, Illinois. Two or three of us boys bought a canoe after walking down the Mississippi River a short, short distance and ran down the river in our frail canoe where we sold our boat. This was rather a novel way to get down the stream, but it was rather pleasant and the cheapest way we could go. I soon got a job at a steam sawmill on the Mississippi River. Here I took a job to wheel away the sawdust and chop up slabs for 50 cents a cord. So between the two jobs, I cleared double wages. But the work proved too hard for me, and my exposure in Missouri was yet leaning upon my system. For my laying on the cold, snowy ground and being on guard night and day much of the time in far west and in Adam on Diamond, I began to feel weak, and it was difficult for me to climb the hill to my boarding place. My knees would nearly give out. This forced me to close out my job, although very reluctantly, and my soul began to feel as though our enemies had dealt very inhumanly with us as a people who were striving to serve the Lord. I engaged a passage to Montrose, Iowa, on a steamboat, and finally engaged as a second cook on the boat, and to continue still further up the Mississippi River to Galena, Illinois, Dubuque, Iowa, and the state of Wisconsin. By so doing, I added to my stock of hard-earned cash, saving pay for my passage home, and would see some new country as well, for the scenery along the banks of the Great River is very attractive, passing Warsaw and Keokuk at the foot of the Great Rapids. Also, passing over the rapids to Commerce at the head of the rapids, as well as Montrose on the opposite side of the river in Iowa Territory. A pilot has to take the steamboat over those dangerous rapids, safely arriving at Commerce. I sent five dollars in money to my mother and word that I designed going up the river to Wisconsin Territory. This word and money I sent by the ferryman, Daniel Davis, who joined the Latter-day Saint Church in Michigan Territory the following year after I did, in 1834. I felt a degree of pride to be able to work and aid my poor widowed mother and could pass on by my humble exile home, feeling happy with a hope someday of having a better home than what we now are enjoying in the barracks. 12 miles and we passed Fort Madison on the banks of the Mississippi River. We also passed Burlington and Rock Island. The pleasure of this delightful trip was interrupted and marred somewhat by my being poorly and finally now taken ill with the diarrhea. And on my return to Montrose, Iowa, I was compelled to give up work and rest at home for a season. I found my mother taking care of Sister Morris Felt's family six miles out from Montrose 
while Sister Phelps and her brother had gone to Missouri to help liberate her husband, Morris Phelps, as well as Parley P. Pratt and others from prison who were in the hands of a Missouri mob. It was at this time, on the occasion of my visit, that I first met Miss Nancy Rita Porter at Sister Phelps' little log house in Father Porter's field. She was then in her 15th year of her age, between 14 and 15, and I learned from her afterwards that she said in her mind, if ever she married, she would like it to be with me. And stranger than fiction, I was rather smitten on my part. In less than six years afterwards, on the seventh day of April, 1845, we were married at conference time in Nauvoo, Illinois, by Charles C. Rich. And on the next day, we received our patriarchal blessings. My mother remained taking charge of the Morris Phelps family until their return from their successful mission. Thus was fulfilled the prophet's words when he was a prisoner at far west Missouri, when he said, Brethren, fear not, for not one of us will be hurt, for God will deliver us. And now the last of the prisoners are free from mob law, and once more breathe the air of freedom which can all the more be appreciated by the contrast we have just emerged from and passed through. Although myself with many others are today suffering the effects of the exposures we have been subjected to and have contracted in our systems, debility, hence sickness, and in some cases death, in consequence of which I was taken down sick with fever, which continued with me until in the fall. At one time, life was despaired of. I was removed from the old barracks to Sister Wright's on Sugar Creek, as a change was thought for my good, and it proved to be so for a time. Mr. and Sister Wright, who was baptized when I was in Silver Lake, Michigan Territory in the fall of 1833, was a good Latter-day Saint. They were very kind to me, but in a relapse. I suffered with burning fever and at times delirious until, for the only time of my recollection, I would not turn my hand to live any longer. While in this condition, my thoughts reverted back to the time of my father with the prospects then surrounding us, which were rather flattering for family comforts and happiness. For we had two homes and 240 acres of land and other comforts surrounding with health and not the least maimed in any form. One of the farms was situated on a lake. The garden ran down, joining on to the lake, which was called Stevenson Lake. The location was very desirable, and although only 11 years of age, I well remember my father planning how he should beautify the homestead with garden walks, flowers, trees, shrubs, after the fashion of some of the old country grounds. He built a skiff at one time for riding upon the beautiful lake and fishing purposes, for the lake abounded with fish of good variety. His first trial in the new boat nearly cost him his life, for by some means the boat capsized. But by aid of the second son, Joseph by name, who was very dexterous and of good mind, paddled a tan vat made by Mr. Judd, of whom my father bought this improved farm. The vat was made of a log dug out, and us boys used it at the lake. It was with this my brother went to the rescue of my father, struggling in the water, clinging as best he could to the capsized craft. Oh, how anxious we all of us watched every move until safely landed once more on the shore. This calls to mind once on a time when this same brother Joseph and my next elder brother to myself, Henry, were out fishing in another lake nearby, for there were numerous lakes in the county of Oakland. My brother Joseph threw his spear at a large fish. Losing his balance, he capsized the boat. The two elder brothers, being good swimmers, struck for the shore, and I mounted the upturned boat and against a slight wind which was drifting me out still further into the lake, I used my hat as a paddle which kept me from drifting out still further than I already was. I was only in my twelfth year of age, but remember that I felt cool, of course, in the cold water. It would naturally enough be so. But also I felt cool and calm, realizing I was safely riding if it was on an upset boat. 
Finally, one of my brothers stripped, swam out, and pushed me into shore safely, but wet enough. I concluded that I, neither my father, were born to be drowned, for once before, while in Albany, New York, before I was quite eight years old, I slipped from a fishing raft into the basin at Albany and with my clothes on. I remember sinking twice, and as three times and out was the drowning man's chance, I commenced to paddle, not with my hat, but with my hands, and soon learned the good use of hands and feet while in the water. And as all fear was removed by the operation, I was not only saved from a watery grave, but soon learned to become an expert swimmer. Well, in the midst of my father's hopes, expectations, and anticipations, he sickened and died when I was 12 years old. Two years after Mormonism claimed my mother and myself, the family scattered and a part of the farm was sold. The other was left and rented, and here was my mother, a widow, two younger sisters, and the baby boy, James, having been robbed of our home and all, and here as exiles living in an old barracks, reduced down to only a cow and a calf, and soon the cow died, and I was so low and sick that it began to look as though life was a clear failure to me, accepting my Mormon religion. Now came a test as to our real hopes religiously. My two elder brothers proffered if we would give up our Mormonism, they would give up their claims on the surviving farm, and we could return and live on the homestead where my father died. In our poverty financially, the temptation looked bright. But then, whosoever putteth his hand to the plow and looketh back to the leeks and onions of Egypt, etc. When the Holy Ghost lit up within me the brightness and grandness of the pearl which was presented unto me at the reception of the gospel, this earth with all its glories looked very small and valueless compared to the pearl of great price now before me. And I felt for the sake of so pure riches I was willing to pass through all earthly tribulations and count them my just due. The Spirit revived in me, and then I wanted to live, and never since that time has that sad feeling entered into my mind. But life eternal and everlasting life has and ever will be uppermost with me, preferring poverty with the other comforter than the riches of earth with all the more confirmed honors for a short season. The Wright family, fearing that I should die on their hands, arranged a conveyance with feather beds removing me to my barracks home in Montrose, Iowa, opposite and in plain sight of Nauvoo the Beautiful. This move just suited me, and from that hour death was removed from me, and I had faith in God, my eternal Father, that I should live to see the day of the coming of Jesus. And afterwards my patriarchal blessing ratified the same, and my last days has been promised me to be my best, happiest, and brightest days of my whole life. About this time sickness became very sad indeed in Nauvoo and Montrose, so very many were sick that the Prophet Joseph called a special fasting and prayer Sunday in Nauvoo for the benefit of the sick. And the elders went forth amongst the people with power. Many were healed. The Prophet came over on our side of the river, and the power of God came with him. A brother Fordham, who was very low and his life despaired of, I knew him in Michigan when he spoke in tongues. Brother Joseph came into his sick room, taking him by the hand. He said, Brother Fordham, arise and be made whole. And he arose, dressed, and went forth with Brother Joseph, administering to others who were sick. These times were very trying. Brother Brigham Young and others were living also in the barracks, fall of 1839, and he and family were sick. There were scarcely well over enough to take care of the sick. Some medicine had been left for me while I was so sick, but I consigned it to the fire and finally recovered from my sickness, but was very weak. I made some money picking prickly ash berries, which were very plentiful in the bottom land of the Missouri River. They were a red berry and was said to be healthy. Edward Stevenson and his fourth wife, Emily Alexa Williams, were the proud parents of 11 children eight sons and three daughters. Electa Melvina William Stevenson was born January 23, 
1858, at Salt Lake City. She was married October 26, 1874, in the Endowment House at Salt Lake City to George Manwaring. She bore him seven children. George Manwaring died July 7, 1889, aged 35, at Salt Lake City, and was buried July 9th in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. She married October 19, 1891, at Salt Lake City, John Johnson. She bore him one child. She married November 5, 1903, at Otis, Idaho, Frederick Steiner. Electa died May 27, age 87, at Salt Lake City, and was buried May 29th in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Henry Randall William Stevenson was born August 31, 1860, at Salt Lake City. He was married April 21, 1886, in the Logan Temple to Hannah Rowena Buckwalder. She bore him 11 children. She died December 16, 1943, aged 81, at Cottonwood, Salt Lake County, and was buried December 20 in the Salt Lake Wasatch Lawn Cemetery. He died March 24, 1942, aged 81, at Cottonwood, and was buried March 26 in the Wasatch Lawn Cemetery. William Orlando William Stevenson was born January 18, 1863, at Salt Lake City. He died November 5, 1865, aged 2, at Salt Lake City, and is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Emily Rosella Stevenson was born March 31, 1865, at Salt Lake City. She was married and sealed March 4, 1885, in the Endowment House at Salt Lake City, to Francis McDonald. She bore him 11 children. He died December 2nd, 1920, age 69, at Holiday, and was buried December 5th in the Holiday Cemetery. Emily died April 26, 1946, age 81, at Holiday, and was buried April 30th in the Holiday City Cemetery. Daniel William Stevenson was born May 29, 1867, at Salt Lake City. He died September 26, 1868, age 1, at Salt Lake City, and is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. John Well Stevenson was born October 29, 1869, at Salt Lake City. He was married June 23, 1897, in the Salt Lake Temple to Sarah Ann Perry. She bore him eight children. She died December 15, 1967, aged 94, at Salt Lake City and was buried December 19th in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. He died April 26, 1954, age 84 at Salt Lake City and was buried April 30th in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Eugene Edward William Stevenson was born September 16, 1872 at Salt Lake City and was married December 18, 1903 in the Salt Lake Temple to Loretta Ellen Staples. She bore him six children. She died December 4, 1961, age 78, at Holiday, and was buried in the Wasatch Lawn Cemetery. He died August 26, 1943, age 70, at Holiday, Salt Lake County, and was buried August 30th in the Wasatch Lawn Cemetery. Lester Alanson William Stevenson was born August 10, 1874, at Salt Lake City, and was married December 17, 1902, in the Salt Lake Temple to Bertha Esther Starley. She bore him nine children. She died October 17, 1957, aged 74, at Salt Lake City, and was buried October 19, in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. He died August 10, 1961, aged 87, at Salt Lake City, and was buried August 12, in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Hiram Smith Stevenson was born August 28, 1876, at Big Cottonwood, Salt Lake County, Utah, and was married September 6, 1905, in the Salt Lake Temple, to Mary Piety Slaughter. She bore him eight children. She died March 17, 1975, at Salt Lake City, and was buried March 30th in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. He died January 12, 1951, aged 74, at Salt Lake City, and was buried January 15th in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. 
Ernest Extra Stevenson was born August 26, 1876 at Big Cottonwood, Salt Lake County, Utah, and was married March 17, 1900 in the Salt Lake Temple to Emma Walker. She bore him five children. She died May 17, 1914, aged 34, at Salt Lake City, and was buried May 20th in the Murray City Cemetery. He married November 17, 1915, Annetta Blanche Gunderson in the Salt Lake Temple. She bore him four children. She died July 29, 1961, aged 70, at Ashton, Fremont County, Idaho, and was buried August 2nd in the Murray City Cemetery. He died June 5, 1956, aged 77, in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County, California, and was buried June 12th in the Murray City Cemetery. Harriet Louisa Stevenson was born November 21, 1880, at Big Cottonwood, Salt Lake County, Utah, and was married September 11, 1901, in the Salt Lake Temple, to Franklin Walker. She bore him 11 children. He died January 13, 1973, aged 94, at Letha, Jim County, Idaho, and was buried at Meridian, Ada County, Idaho. She died July 16, 1956, aged 75, at Caldwell Canyon County, Idaho, and was buried July 19 at Meridian, Ada County, Idaho. As descendants of these fine and faithful people, let us remember their strong, wonderful qualities and try to live our lives to make them proud of us.